So it's 6.45 now. We can wait a few more minutes. Um, in the meantime, we could just kind of, I think it would be nice to just kind of settle in, uh, think about the Sabbath. Okay, yep, we can do that. I've heard most of the questions. Okay. There are a thousand programs, so we've heard a lot of the questions. So All right. It's rare I get stumped. But I want, I should well, before vote. we start, has, has anybody heard of uh, Brother Jim Burr? Okay, all right. Two people. So he's here from, all the way from uh, Colorado. Colorado. They yeah. used to live in Denver, yeah. now they live south of De uh, Denver. I broke my hip, I fractured my hip. I'm recovering from a hip, That's, hip well, injury. He's doing, he's doing well. Um, anyway, we're really glad to have them both here and his wife. Oh, where'd she go? Oh, right here. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was Glean of it. Dieta. And uh, so, yeah, it's exciting uh, to have them here. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow's presentations as well. I think, did you just make a trip over from 3ABN? Or yeah, we were at 3ABN yesterday, and we recorded uh, 32 radio programs. And it's interactive radio, and it's for, it'll be on Avis World Radio. It'll be on four different networks. But what's exciting? You can have radio with all the pictures because Google, this next, I mean, these are 15 minute programs. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So get your, get your phone out and Google, and you'll see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So some of those programs, I had several, you know, look at the, you know, Different pictures. And, uh, so the ladies in the studio, in the control room, they were in there with their phones, two ladies in there, and they're just really having a ball, man. They thought this was really great because a radio, with astronomy, how do you do it without pictures, but with the, with the Google thing. Yeah. So they're going to air that in a couple, in a month, uh, next month, the first of May. No, that's no, middle of May, something like that. Okay. And, awesome. Uh, well, we'll keep praying that that will go well and people will hear on the radios and do the Googling. I was also going to ask you real quick, how many countries have you presented these things in over the years? Oh, I don't know. We've been in Russia, 22 cities all over Russia. We've been to Galena's house, mm -hmm. her home, mm -hmm. in, in uh, Novonovsk or something like that. Yeah, Novonovsk. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, yeah, we've been... Uh, yeah, all over Russia. I've been five trips to did the ASI Center. The, the last trip was the ASI, speaking at ASI. And, uh, you know, we've been to Dominican Republic and Panama and Haiti and, uh, Pan uh, you, I mean, uh, Alaska and, and all over the U.S., of course. Okay. Excellent. You know. Okay. And people in Russia, they watch you on Sputnik TV because 3ABN, I've recorded in the 90s, and it was on Russia. It was broadcast in Russia on 3ABN, and so then they said, that's how we made a contact of getting invited to come to Russia, but they said, we watch you on Sputnik TV. Sputnik TV. Sputnik TV. All right. <laughs> Remember Sputnik? Yeah, the little, sa the first satellite, yeah. orbit the they Earth. They beat us, they beat us in that's space. <laughs> that's, they beat us for just a little while anyway. We were in a war with the Russians. <laughs> Amazing. Well, does anybody, um, well, before we start, we can have a little prayer. And then, uh, and then we'll, we can open it up for a couple of questions, and yeah. then we can start the program. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's bow our heads for a moment. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for uh, just taking time to visit this little corner of the universe to hear our prayers. You know that uh, we are just very insignificant when it comes to size <coughs> and space. As we look at some of the pictures of the universe, we realize how small we are. We're like but, but dust, um, as we're told in Scripture. But yet you remember us, and not only that, but you came in the flesh to visit and to die for us, this little planet, this little rebellious planet out here in the middle of the, the ocean of the universe. And we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for the Sabbath that points us back to your creative power and also for your redemption in, our, in your recreative power in our hearts. We pray that these meetings would be a blessing to us, to those who are watching online as well. And uh, we ask that you would be with uh, Elder Jim Burr as he speaks and brings us this message. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I All right. remember we did a camp meeting in France, and my wife, they flew okay. us both over, and camp meeting in Australia. 
So France uh, and Australia it, yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. some of those places. <laughs> so been been around a little bit. Well, that's that's wonderful. Um, I, has anybody else here been in Australia by chance? You've been in Australia. Was it in the Navy or part just traveling? Oh, okay, so did some, okay. Yeah, I've never been there, so that's kind of a place I'd like to go someday. Well, why don't we just, uh, let's see if we've got a question. Why don't we can... Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Satellite space, star, okay. black hole. Yeah, and they have a new telescope. Yeah, J James Webb. Webb. James Webb scope. Okay. okay, yeah, and so, and so they, tell me more about that when they were looking at what they said they were going to see nothing in there, and then they found more stars. Yeah, uh, tomorrow we'll be showing you some of that. Um, the James Webb, and I'll be talking about, I'll show you pictures of James Webb talking about that tonight. Um, What's interesting, there have been article after article about the James Webb telescopes. They're worried that it's going to de destroy the Big Bang because it's discovering galaxies that, that are older, they shouldn't be there. And I, I've seen at mm. least uh, half a dozen articles, and they're really worried. And uh, one of them said, you know, it just keeps me awake night thinking what will happen if it proves the Big Bang. <laughs> Didn't bang, you know. <laughs> didn't didn't happen. But, um, and there's a lot of misinformation out there too. There's a lot of misinformation. So uh, I have don't have it in the <clears throat> program here tonight. But there's okay. there's a picture. The artists go to work and they show you the biggest. We've discovered the biggest black hole, and they got these beautiful stars going around this dark thing, you know. And then I show you the real picture, and there's an arrow there. There's the black hole. You don't see any anything at all, and. Uh, there's an article in Astronomy Magazine that says, people who study black hole are cosmic magicians. They need to coax a great deal of meaning out of precious little information. <laughs> mm. Mm. I mean, there, maybe there are black holes, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. No, Any other questions? But we'll talk about James Ooh. Webb. And, uh, so many things I don't know. <laughs> it's incredible. Any other questions before we start? No? Well, I'm sure okay. we might have more later on for sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so we're going to be talking about space, and one of the subjects comes up is, are we going to, you know, will they go to Mars? And uh, Elon Musk, you know, this week had this incredible uh, rocket launch, and uh, let me turn this thing on. And uh, will we ever go to Mars? And the Antarctic actually is more comfortable than Mars is. Um, but Elon Musk had this humongous rocket, 30-some uh, rockets, the tallest ever built, fired, and then it, it blew up in space. I went to see the uh, X-10 launch down in Padre Island. Uh, a guy, a customer of ours, flew, us down, flew me down there in his jet. And uh, that thing had three of these rockets. And when that thing fired, it was like somebody hit you in the stomach. We were six miles away. And we had the binocular telescope, we went up and we watched it go up eight miles and then it flipped over and come down on its side and then it landed, fired and landed, it stood there, it looked pretty cool. And then after a while, we could see the fire hoses, robotic fire trucks were pouring all this water because there was still a fire underneath it. And after about five minutes, and a lot of people never saw this, but after five minutes, that thing just exploded and went back up and crashed, you know, the X-10 uh, rocket launch. And they told us that this big one was going to have like 30 rockets, uh, these engines on there, and that they said that they had to get it way away from the population because it was so loud, you know, so that was kind of cool. But our, there's a, problems going to Mar a lot of pars problems going to Mars because you don't have the protection of our magnetic field and the Van Allen belts protect us from charged particles from the sun and you could get, easily get cancer. There's all kinds of ways where we could shield them, protect them. If, you know, maybe we could develop a pill that would make them immune to this, um, put a magnetic field around them, charge them with a voltage, all these things. Uh, and, and you know something, you cannot grow a garden on the moon. And I bet you can't grow a garden on Mars. There's nothing, there's no humus, there's no vegetation that's decomposed to, to I mean, they could get the plants to sprout, but you could not live in a garden, and this earth, <laughs> you know, 
this was made for mankind. This Earth was designed for that. So anyhow, uh, going to Mars, we're going to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, it's going to be serious problems trying to get. It's a two-year. Mars comes around every two years, and it would take us six months to get there when it's the closest approach. The closest is 50 million miles, and, uh, and so it would take us six months to get there, and then we'd go two years later, we'd come home, and uh, to try to take enough you know, peanut butter jelly sandwiches for that is going to be a problem. But being in space and building telescopes, people ask me, uh, okay, well, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, you've heard the saying that what goes up must come down, will come down. That is not true. What goes up does not have to come down. It's just you didn't throw it hard enough. If you put it in orbit, it will not come back down, okay? Which is what we do with all of our spacecraft. Right now, the Voyager uh, 1 and 2 are way out there beyond the heliopause and uh, leaving. I don't think they're ever coming back. So, uh, and so they said we could put restaurants on the moon, but there'd be one problem. They wouldn't have any atmosphere. <laughs> now, people ask me if I'd like to go to space. Actually, when Elon Musk sends his mother into space and brings her back safe, then we'll talk about it, okay? Um, so, We've lived, my wife and I have lived in Colorado for 49 years, 50 years now, I guess. We lived at this, in the mountain home for, for 49 years, and we had elk that would love to mow the lawn for us, and all kinds of animals. We had bear uh, show up once in a while, and deer would actually eat from your hand. And I designed and invented the binocular telescope. Uh, I don't know if you know that, recognize that, that's a cool thing there on the screen. Uh, when you can use both eyes, it is an incredible world when you can use both eyes to look at dim, you're looking at dim galaxy. You would not believe how much better it is. And we designed some bigger ones. That was an 8-inch one. Here you see a 6-inch, a 10-inch, and 12, uh, four, a 16-inch one, the big one. And we sold those all over the world. Did, I designed two telescopes for NASA for the Mars Science Lab to get data back from Mars on a telescope like that. And this is the biggest one we built. This is on a four-wheel trailer. Uh, it's a 40-inch telescope. It's up in New York. So that's what I've been doing. And when I get 80 years old, my kids said, Dad, you have got to, what if you have a stroke? What are, you, what are we going to do? We had a 21,000 square foot building. We had 15 employees. Kids said, you have got to get out of this. And we sold the building. Somebody from California took the products that they wanted. and. Uh, and so I kind of more or less retired. I'm still building a few telescopes, actually. This is the most beautiful picture we had just on the 14th of April, I believe it was. Uh, and this is from Lapland. Oh, uh, it's April 19th, okay, this month, uh, of the Northern Lights. You've been hearing about the Northern Lights. In fact, we were told that you could probably see it, hopefully, this last week. It was, I was somewhere, I don't know. But uh, that's the most beautiful picture I've ever seen of the Northern Lights. And you can find this. This is on NASA Picture of the Day for April 19. At NASA Picture of the Day, if you go to our website, we have a link there, or you can just dial in Picture of the Day. Every day, NASA has a new picture. That's the first thing I do in the morning to see what NASA's picture is. And this was just really cool. I was raised in Minnesota, so I've seen Northern Lights, but I've never seen anything like this. Um, the Northern Lights... Uh, you know, tend to look like ne neon lights, actually. And, and, and I've been to Alaska. We've seen them in Alaska and Canada when we go up and do uh, programs up there. But, but it's like a fluorescent light, and sometimes they'll go, you know, they'll... <laughs> the different colors will flash across the sky. So it's, it's a lot of fun to see, but this I thought I'd share with you because this was the, the best one I've ever seen. Uh, let's see. Uh, got a few pictures for the kids. Do we have any, how many kids here? Okay. You're not going to have to pretend you're kids. You ever see a cloud that reminds you of a funny old man or a, a big bird or a hummingbird? Well, we see, when you look through telescopes, we see things that look like the butterfly. It's the butterfly wing nebula. It's a, nebulas, are, there's basically four types of nebulae out there. There's nebulae that glow because they're hot. Nebulae that glow because there's hot stars embedded in them. There's nebulae that are dark, like the horsehead nebulae, like you saw on the screen earlier. And then there's stars that seem to use their fuel, get bigger and bigger, bigger, like a balloon, they pop. We call that a nova or a supernova, and that's 
makes a ring that looks like a planet, and they were called planetary nebulae. So it's, a nebula is just a word for cloud, okay? It's just a Latin word for cloud, but there are four type out there. Type that are hot and glow, type that have a lot of stars that make them glow, type that are dark, like the horse head, and types that are, are exploding stars. Uh, so here's the guitar nebula, and uh, here's Tiger Woods trying to get a hole in one on the moon. <laughs> Um, here's the mountains of grace where we live. Um, here's the seagull nebula. And we have hundreds of these. In fact, I put together 275 pictures like this for the Michigan conference. They were going to do, for the adventurers, they were going to do astronomy this year, invited me in and to speak to the leadership and, and uh, help them teach astronomy. And we sent, I sent 50 videos out to different clubs in Michigan with all these pictures. And what I suggested, I mean, how do you teach little kids astronomy? I said, what I would do would be assign, Bill, this meeting, you go home and learn everything you can learn about the Seagull Nebula. When you come back next week, tell us. So they had signed that, uh, the 275 pictures, assigned the kids, it was all on the internet anyway, right, you know. So as, as a way of they could learn about the heavens by doing their homework and sharing with the, uh, so that was kind of fun. We have a happy face on Mars, and we have a smiley face in the universe. And this, you see those arcs, those are, are bent by gravitational lensing because there's a, apparently a lot of mass in the center and actually bends the galaxies uh, to, uh, you know, to follow the, uh, uh, gravitational effect, where light is actually bent by, by gravity. Uh, here's the cat's eye nebula coming up, okay. <laughs> here is a, through an, a, this is the kind of a picture you'd see in a, you know, a, a $2,000 telescope probably. Okay, but here's the Hubble in black and white, the cat's eye, it uh, sends out a blast, a jet kind of out of the center. It's always when these stars, uh, go supernova and nova. There's always a star in the center. There's always one in the center, and you see that uh, there. And here it is in color. And okay, here's the James Webb Telescope. Uh, and this was named, I wonder how they come with that name. Actually, James E. Webb uh, was the administrator of NASA during the launch of, well, from 61 to 68 during the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo program. So that's how we got the name of JW. Uh, JWT, James Webb Telescope. It's 21 feet across. The Hubble is 94 inches across. So you see it's, it's huge. It's huge. And, uh, but there are some problems because it's, you see the Hubble is protected pretty much with that tube. But the James Webb scope is getting hit with little meteorites. And they've got uh, 17 little particles that have hit it already on the surface. One of them was bigger than they had thought it would happen. And uh, my question is, what's going to happen to James Webb in 10 years or 20 years, 10, you know, whatever, the, uh, because of the meteor showers that we have. And, uh, you know, we had that huge meteor shower in 1833, little particles of dust left over from Te Comet Temple Tuttle, and to the point that the, these, the comet leaves uh, vapor and little particles of dust and sand behind it. And the Earth is going around 66,000 miles around, an hour around the sun, and these particles, like rubbing your hands together, it gets hot. I mean, these things just burn up as we are going around the sun. We run into this path where a comet has been. In 1833, the greatest display ever, they were figuring 100,000 an hour meteor shower, particles of falling stars, they call them. They weren't stars, but they were particles of dust. 100,000 an hour. They've, some people thought there was, uh, would, all the stars fell. There wouldn't be any stars the next night. And they were all there because he's strong in power, not one fails. But what happens when the James Webb Telescope goes through one of these areas? Because uh, this was a result of Comet Temple Tuttle. It goes around every 33 years and leaves debris behind it. And uh, it, the next time will be... 2033, we're going to have a display cover. We have every, like in, 18, in 1966, we had a big display of that same, every 33 years a comet goes around. In 1999, it was projected that the East uh, Orient would get 
a beautiful shower. Nothing like the one that happened, I don't think, in 1833, but it was a, still a spectacular shower. And uh, so what's going to happen when the Hubble goes around? We have the Perseid every August, meteor showers that, that appear to come from the constellation of Perseus. The, the name comes, tells you, like it was the Leonids come from Leo, and the Perseids come, the Geminis come from Gemini. Uh, and so that tells you wh what part of the sky they're coming from. Leo in December, uh, in November, excuse me, is straight overhead. And the Leonoids, 1833, they came straight down. The Perseids always like come from the north. But they leave these particles. So what's going to happen as the years go by, and Hubble, uh, James Webb scope is not protected. You know, I'm just curious to see, you know, interest of what, to, what effect that's going to have on its performance. So uh, it's interesting that, that uh, NASA's uh, James Webb Next Generation Space Observer can't manage to see supernova black holes directly. That was kind of cool to, to see they would acknowledge that. It has a sun shield on it, and, and you know, it is infrared. It gets pictures in the infrared spectrum. Well, Hubble was Kodak. Most of the pictures from Hubble was absolute Kodak. I've taken some pictures that you could see. The, all the colors that the Hubble shows you, I get the same colors. Now, it can, still, it can do a thousand times better than anything I can do. But the big objects like Orion, you can't tell the difference from... They're so big, the pictures I can get from one of our telescopes to uh, what the Hubble gets. The, the Hubble's Kodak moment. But the James Webb scope is not going to give us the colors. It's going to have to be because it's, it's infrared. And we have uh, three different ranges of infrared, uh, the uh, short, med medium, and long uh, waves. And so they actually assign color. And sometimes I think they use the Hubble uh, to give them, uh, you know, the, the color. For instance, the, probably about, t oh, maybe, I don't know if it's 10% of the Hubble, they'll do for research because they'll look at, uh, like, the, uh, uh, the Rosette Nebula, and they want to know what is here, and so they'll take four pictures of it, and they'll put a filter over it, and they'll say this, we're going to put an oxygen three filter over, and this will be blue. And then we'll put a hydrogen alpha filter over, and that'll be green, and this will be red. So they assign colors, but the Hubble, is, I mean, it's, it's a very small percentage. I know some of them that have been researched, and they assign colors, but vast majority of Hubble is like you'd get with a Kodak camera. But the James Webb scope is not going to be that way. It's infrared. It's a heat present there. So... Uh, when you see the pictures from the James Webb, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you're getting the, uh, the true color. And so there's a shield, because there's heat. They've got to protect it from the sun, so they have this big shield there to protect it from the sun. And what's the purpose of James, JWST? Well, they have evolution, you know, the Big Bang, trying to verify where we came from. And uh, why does it have to be so cold? We talked about that already. So that's an illustration of the falling of the stars in 1833, and I'm just interesting to see. What happens? This is really interesting where they park the James Webb scope. There are five points, Lagrange points, around our Earth. You see where gravity is null. Right between the sun and the Earth, there's a place you can park a satellite, and it doesn't hardly need any rocket correction. It just kind of sits there. There's no, it's a null gravitational point. Our geosynchronous satellites at 23,000 miles out here, we have to fly them. AT&T flies them all. And uh, I work, I've been working, I still work for Dish Network, okay, in the satellite industry. I could tell you some stories. But uh, we keep our geosynchronous satellites within a 70-mile box. And there's rocketry because they tend to drift forward, and they fire the rockets, take them back to keep them within this box every couple month or two. Uh, and so they tend to drift. But when you go to the, the Lagrange points, there's... Five areas there where the, uh, you can park a satellite. So the James Webb scope is parked on the right in the L2, um, L2 position. You see the Earth is in the little green dot there. Okay, and that's L2. And, uh, and there's, there's five points there. The uh, people who believe in aliens and UFOs say that the, all the UFOs are over there in L3 uh, where we can't see them because they're behind the sun. So... Anyhow, that's kind of cool how they, they park it there and it doesn't need hardly any, I don't know if it needs any correction at all or pretty much stays, pretty much stays there. Um, the subject always comes up of, of uh, flat earth and this is actually all you need for flat earth, okay? Uh, 
if the earth is flat, it's day, 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 and if it's not, you've got day and night. But just one more proof. You can actually prove. If people believe the earth is flat, you can prove that tonight. Here's how you prove it. And, and you Google internet. Okay, on a flat earth, you cannot have satellites. They all agree. You can't have a satellite. There's no gravity on a flat earth. They say uh, gravity uh, feels like gravity because this earth is moving up. This flat earth is moving up. It feels like gravity. You cannot have a satellite. Absolutely everybody will have to agree with that. So tonight you can go out at 3 uh, 42 in the morning and see the International Space Station go over. It will be as bright as any star or brighter than any star in the sky. Maybe not as bright as Venus. Sometimes it is. Very, very bright. It's going to be, for one minute, it's going to go across the sky tonight. But on the 8th of, uh, and, um, and Saturday night, it'll be 341 it's going to go across. But on May, May 8th, it's going to be in the sky for five minutes. It, it, you know, it depends on the angles coming at, but this will be the biggest display. And it's 520 in the morning before sunrise. Get up five and pr get up five twenty on sa on the eighth, the morning of the eighth, Monday, May eighth, and prove the Earth is not flat. I mean, we were at camp meeting in and we were doing camp meeting up in the um, in Montana, in Wyoming actually, and I did the lecture and we took we we're out with telescopes, and all of a sudden here was this thing as bright as Venus just coming across. It was, it's floating across the sky about like that. You just see it move. It was so cool. We can actually put the telescope on it. And uh, we've seen, anyhow, so you can prove there's no flat Earth. Enough of that. But, you know, one Earth, a million Earths would fit in the sun. Our little Earth is so tiny, one million would fit inside. 1,300 Jupiters would fit inside. Oh, by the way, they finally figured out what the rings on Saturn are made of. It's uh, lost airline luggage. I flew into Knoxville this last year, did it up there. At, I forget the name of the town. We did a school up there all, all weekend, and they lost my luggage. And uh, anyway, I won't go into that, but I didn't get it till Tuesday. I flew on a Friday. I get my luggage till Tuesday because Frontier doesn't deliver luggage. I had to go wait to find it, and then I had to go back. Anyway, uh, this picture was taken when the sun was right behind Saturn, the Cassini spacecraft going around. Okay, so the sun is right behind it. You see the sun rays and so forth there. And uh, you got your picture taken here. Do you know that? There is the Earth from a billion miles away. And you're on it. Were you smiling when they took your picture? You know what's interesting? Ellen White went to Australia in the 1800s on a ship in the 1800s, it would take you, depending on the wind, six to eight weeks to get to Australia, four to eight weeks, actually, to get to Australia, depending on the winds. And, of course, they stopped along the way, too. But figure four to eight weeks. If you had been on a ship for, let's say, six weeks, all you saw was ocean every day, every night, and you're, going, you're sailing to Australia, what would you tell your friends when you got home? You know how far that is. You, you have no idea how far Australia is. You can't imagine, right? Well, Ellen White had seen stuff that only the Hubble telescope, I can show you that. She saw stuff only the Hubble telescope has seen. She was permitted to view stuff. I'm going to prove that more to you tomorrow. You know what she said when she got home? If men could see for a moment beyond the range of finite vision, if they could catch a glimpse of the eternal, every mouth would be stopped in its boasting. Men living on this, how big is an atom? This little atom of a world are finite. You could only say that if you had seen something bigger than the experience on a ship for six or eight weeks. If Saturn was placed where our moon is, that's what Saturn would look like. Wouldn't that be something? God loves rings. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living on a ring uh, that, uh, on a planet that has rings that go up seventy-five thousand miles? Can you imagine rising a sunrise or sunset rippling through rings that go up seventy-five thousand miles? The Bible says, "Eye has not seen, or ear has not heard, hasn't even entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love Him." 
And we've uh, discovered a lot of rings out there. Rings around, now the satellites discovered rings around our sun, rings around Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, rings about Betelgeuse, that giant star in Orion, that shoulder star, when you look, if you're looking at Orion this way, this star, has rings around it. And if you were to drive across those at 1,000 miles a day, it would take you like 20 million years to get across the rings of Betelgeuse at 1,000 miles a day. But God apparently likes rings. Uh, here's an illustration if somebody put a million Earths inside of a globe, our sun, and I couldn't take them on the plane, but I like to bring a, you know, one of those big three-foot balls, beach ball, whatever it is, it's three foot across. And on the rostrum, we'll have choices of how big would the Earth be. If that's the sun, how big would the Earth be? And we have different sizes here. Guess what? the earth would be like a little small grape. And how far away would the earth be on this scale? I hit the wrong button here, okay. 52 miles. This little earth, this little grape would be 52 miles away. And think how hot, how hot is that sun? If you're sitting out there 52 miles, how hot would that sun be? You think how hot is a sun on a, heat, on a hot day? I mean, that thing is cranking out power. We have this earth. We, we're 93 million miles away from the earth. We're 90, we only get a little sliver. We get one half of 10 millionth of the power that sun cranks. That sun cranking out in every direction. I mean, you can put tens of billions of earths all around that thing. We just get a little sliver. Where did that power come from? You take your car to the gas station every 300 miles. How come we never take the sun to the gas station? That's going for five billion years, they tell us. Exactly. Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. He had the power that could call everything, you know, dis everything obeys him. The wind obeys him. The waves obey him. You know, everybody, everything obeys him on the planet. The dead ob obey him. He rises except us. <laughs> but he's going to fix that pretty soon. Incredible power by the word of the Lord. Where the heavens made and the Hadron Collider has proven, Psalm 33, verse 6. The Hadron Collider has actually made a, a few protons with a million dollars worth of electricity. The Hadron Collider in Switzerland is actually proven by the word of the Lord of the heavens made. If you have enough power, they took a million dollars worth of energy and made, I think, 16 protons. That never existed before. Well, you could put 100,000 on the head of a pin or, I don't know, they're, they're very small, but they proved that scripture. And so looking at our little sun compared to, is that, is that the biggest star? Well, way down there at the left-hand corner, you see our sun. We can't even put a, a, a dot there and show you how big the sun is. And we compare it to Betelgeuse and Antares, Eldebron and Rigel. And then we have Canis Majoris, the biggest sun we know about. That is 1.8 billion miles in diameter. And there's our sun compared to Canis Majoris. And look at that little dot and think we have a million Earths inside there. <coughs> Are you beginning to feel like a bug on the windshield of life? There's an interesting statement in Christ in the Tsar of Ages. It says, The Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. He desires his chosen heritage to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. Yes. One soul is of such value that in comparison with it, worlds sink into insignificance. Is that an amazing statement? One value, one soul is so valuable, worlds sink into insignificance. And over at 3 ABN, we played, the, we played the Hubble zoom, or the Hubble zooms in to find the last galaxy. And it's zooming in, and galaxies are flying by, galaxies are flying by. Each galaxy is like 100 billion stars. If you were just going to pause the screen, if you were going to visit all the stars on one of those fuzzy little things, it would take you 14 billion years if you spent a week on each star system. And these galaxies, we can't see the end of them, just flying by, and I told the audience, one soul is more valuable than all of that because there's a statement in our Sabbath school lesson, I think it was the last quarter, first year, said you cannot exaggerate <laughs> the value of one soul. You can't exaggerate. So when I'm showing you all these galaxies and telling you that one soul is more valuable than that whole universe, 
You can't exaggerate that, she says. So uh, we live in the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, our sun is kind of out here on the, we're about two-thirds of the way out in what's known as the Orion arm, where that arrow is. Um, and that's where our sun is. If you were to go to the other side of the galaxy and you want to, you know, call home, you get your phone out and dial it up, those radio waves traveling 186,000 miles every second, it's going to take you 100,000 years to get the phone call across that galaxy. If mama says hello, it's going to be 200,000 years to hear the hello. That's how big they are. I had a Dodge van. It took me 10 years to get 186,000 miles on that Dodge van. At a speed of light, boom, could have done it like that. So the, this is, uh, you know, they're huge. And people have sometimes difficulty with terminology because what's a constellation, what's a nebula, what's a, a, a galaxy? A galaxy is just like a hurricane on the Weather Channel. You know, it just uh, looks like that. It's rotating, and uh, I guess that, that one's picture is rotating that way. Stars in the center are just screaming around. The stars in the center are going around every 20, 30, 40 years. We plot, but on the outer edge, it may take 100 million years, 200 million years for those stars on the edge to catch up with the little stars in the center. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's see what we got here. So we have 88 constellations. They've been around for a long time. They're now adding a few new constellations. There's Orion. Um, my wife and I were in a camp meeting in Australia, and we took a solar telescope along to look at the sun. And we see, and we got there Friday afternoon, and this is what we saw: uh, biggest eruption I had ever seen on the sun. I have a telescope, a couple of telescopes. One looks at sunspots, but one looks at flames and eruptions. And and uh, we took that one along, and wow, what a picture! That, I mean. <laughs> That was a huge eruption. Since then, we had another one this last year, uh, just like that. But it's fun to watch the sun every day because you get eruption. You never know. When. It's making a lot of uh, uh, media today. There, it seems like every week they're talking about the sun going. Through. It's increasing now. It's going to reach its peak of uh, activity uh, this in 2024, or yeah, I believe it's 2020. Another object I like to look at is the Northern Cross, and this would be in the sky tonight, a little bit to the west. But uh, there's Danab, and you see the cross here. We have a southern cross and a northern cross. But what's cool, this little star right here, Albireo, is a double star, the most beautiful blue and baby star, uh, baby blue and gold star, gold star side by side. And that's the foot of the cross, Albireo. We call it Albireo, but it's actually two stars, a blue star and a gold star. And it's right at the bottom of the cross. But if you go out at night, you see a bright star, Danab, and if you watch, you can see the cross stars. And, this one's a little bit hard to see if you've got city lights. Um, so anyhow, what do I like to look at? Well, uh, through this binocular telescope, this is a lot of fun. We, we take the, we've got handlebars in the binocular telescopes. So you go up and you find the jet contrail, and then you follow it to the jet. And you can see the plane, you can see the windows, you can see you know, whose plane it is. It's and at night, at sunset, when the sun is just hitting that gas, you know, after a little bit dark, and it just will blow you away in a binocular telescope watching that swirling, swirling jet. This is another one of my favorite objects. It's, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't have a name. It's a needle, well, a needle galaxy, but it's NGC 1957. Uh, uh, and we're looking at the edge, on of a, edge of a galaxy, where with the other pictures we've seen them face on, but this is edge on. Very thin, have dust in the middle, and we have a bulge of stars there. Here's some of my favorite galaxies, M81, M82, and I can see both in my binocular telescope, I can get the two galaxies in. And what I like about them, they're circumpolar. They're up in the north, I see them year-round, uh, but there's three here that are in Leo, and this, I can get all three galaxies in my binocular telescope, but the problem is it's not all year-round. They're at late uh, spring, summer, and then they're gone, but three, I mean, we're talking 36 million light years away, okay? Leo's Trio, three, three galaxies, and uh, they say there's 200 billion stars in that one. But look at the scripture. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9. 55, 9. God's ways are 36 million times what our ways are, or our thoughts are. No, it's more than that, because they believe we've seen a galaxy that's 13.7 billion light years away. Light years six trillion, 
We've got 13 billion times 6 trillion. That's how much higher God's ways are and God's thoughts are than mine are. It's an awesome God that we worship. Here's a whirlpool galaxy right off the handle of the Big Dipper, uh, 37 million light years away, one of my favorite objects, and a gravitational uh, you know, a, attraction. The little galaxy is tied through an arm, the gravity here to the uh, left side as this thing rotates around. And so, tell you a little story. I was getting on an airplane <clears throat> out of Seattle. It's a three-hour flight to Denver, and I usually I try to remember to pray before I get on, Lord, is there somebody you want me to share with? And so I had my computer out once we got in the air, and the guy sitting next to me, you know, he says, oh, you're doing a seminar. What's your seminar on? I says, well, it's on astronomy and the Bible. And he goes like, how do you put the Bible and astronomy together? I said, you believe in God? And he goes like, nah, you know. He's a science teacher. And he is, I would say he is never going to be the same. And so I went through, and I, was just, I, I gave him the whole load of astronomy in the Bible, but I'm, I don't have time for that tonight. I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of DNA and SARS, okay? So I showed him this next picture on the screen. I got the computer there, he's sitting there. And I said, you see that last galaxy, 13.7 billion. Can you comprehend a billion? Can you comprehend a light year? They tell us that galaxy, that little red dot, is 13.7 billion light years away. And your Bible says in Psalm 102, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great God's mercy is. Can you comprehend that galaxy? Can you comprehend? You can't comprehend how great God's mercy is. I said, then the next verse says, can you comprehend how far the east is from the west? Because the Bible says that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. Uh, and, oh, by the way, you know how you find the last galaxy? Uh, you watch for the arrows. The ones with the arrows are the last galaxy. <laughs> Uh, and in the days of Jeremiah, they had counted the stars. Scientists, had, they knew with, before the telescope there was about five to 6,000 stars in the sky with a naked eye. But, and I told him, I said, you know, there's a guy, Jeremiah, said that those stars are like the sands of the seashore. I said, there must have been people who put Jeremiah in a mental institution. Jeremiah, don't you re ever read the Guinness Book of World Records? Jeremiah, our scientists have counted the stars. We know there's 5,000 or 6,000 stars. And Jeremiah said, no, like sands of the seashore, innumerable. Uh, I will make the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who ministered before him as countless as the stars of the sky and as measureless as the sands of the seashore. Do you know, scientists today would agree with Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was here, they probably didn't agree because they knew there were five, 6,000 stars. Jeremiah was scientifically accurate. Today, scientists take, if you took the beaches, the sand on all the beaches of Earth, roughly equivalent to all the stars in the known universe. So we went on, and I showed him, I told him about Arcturus. And God said to Job, can you guide Arcturus with its sons? What is that all about? Or bind the Pleiades, or can you loose the belts of Orion, or bring forth Meseroth? So Arcturus is a runaway star traveling through our galaxy at about 400,000 miles an hour in Job 38, 31. Okay, it has not yet collided. The implication is God is guiding Arcturus, right, with its sons. Okay, well, what's, we'll tell you about that. Okay, let's look. If you Google Arcturan stream, Arcturus, here's what you find out. Arcturus is a part of the Arcturan stream, a group of ancient stars which move at a different angle and at a greater speed than other stars in our galaxy. And it's taking, scientists now tell us it has 52 little stars, traveling with Arcturus through the galaxy. Scientifically accurate statement written thousands and thousands of years ago. Can you loose the belts of Orion? I'll show you that. People are still taking pictures. Okay. Uh, or can you uh, bind the Pleiades? Well, the Pleiades are seven sisters. They're bound together like a flock of birds. They're moving to the east at 90,000 miles an hour. The seven sisters moving to the east. There's actually... Um, uh, quite a, uh, I think it's about 500 stars in that, but that's, you're going to see tomorrow stars, a video clip where the stars are moving like every way. The Hubble did a, uh, did a zoom and made a video of the star motion of the Omega star cluster, and they're just moving like crazy. Uh, but the Pleiades are bound together like a flock of birds. So 
Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, it loose the belts of Orion. Now here's Orion, there's Betelgeuse and the belts of Orion, and they have discovered three stars at high speeds. They have traced these stars back to the belt, and they're in completely different constellations now, and maybe that's what uh, God was talking about when he said to loose the belts of Orion. The Pleiades are bound together. There they are, the seven sisters. Uh, and move along, and, and I, I've skipped a lot of stuff that he got, but uh, you get the idea. This is what we killed George Washington with, something like this. Because all the smartest doctors in the world knew that if you got a fever, you had too much blood, and they had bloodletting. These little devices you could put across the rid, wrist, and George Washington got this terrible fever. Towards evening, they called in a doctor, and they had a bloodletting. Okay, and next morning, if you read the story, I think there were five more times they came in to let his blood out. He knew he had too much blood. Well, I've been to Mount Vernon where his where he lived, okay? And in his bedroom, there is the Bible. And the Bible had the answer. In Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, for the life of all flesh is the blood. And be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life. Deuteronomy 12, 23. Here was the answer. On George Washington's night's end was the Bible, was the answer, but the doctors hadn't know about it. Don't you think he had the best doctors money could buy? <laughs> and they killed Joe. And that evening, the next day, he was dead from bloodletting. Um, all he probably needed was a little garlic to get over that cold, right? Anyhow, this, um, I have this book, Islamic Cosmological Doctrines. And so we're talking about the Bible in, uh, in cosmology. Let's look at what Islamic cosmological doctrine says. There's people, the moon is a, inhabited by people with short trunks and rapid motions. The cities are nine, uh, page 271. And the sun is a kingdom whose inhabitants are very large and bodies are very handsome. The number of their stars is five. The stars are luminous spherical bodies altogether 1,029 in number. This is Islamic cosmological doctrines in comparison to the... Uh, the Bible. Okay, so we're, I want to give you the DNA version, okay, of what he heard. And he teaches this stuff. He knew what I was talking about. And so on the screen is your DNA code. One page of AT, your, your letter codes A, T, uh, C, and G. And you would need about five million pages like this. This is one page in your DNA, but you need about five million pages if you're going to look at one cell. And I said to this guy, you know, when you conceive now, you could sit on the head of that pin. When you conceive with your mother, you would fit on the head of that pin. And that little cell has to copy your DNA in 30, 24 to 30 hours. Got to make a copy of that in 24, 30 hours. And if you were sitting at a keyboard, if you were going to type out the information in just one cell, and you could type 65 words a minute, and you could type it out, it would take you a life, 50 years Eight hours a day, 50 years, 65 words a minute, would take you 50 years to type out the information in just one cell. And he started to get blown away. I never thought about that. And I said, if, if you're doing this at a keyboard, would you be making mistakes if you typed this out? For, well, of course you would. Well, so does your body. Your cell, when it copies, when it makes a copy of this, it can make up to a million mistakes every replication. Why does it make uh, mistakes? Because we live in a world, a polluted world, because of free radicals, because of carcinogenic stuff we put in our body, because we didn't get enough sleep, didn't get enough water, didn't get water going enough. She's telling me, like my wife, I need more water, but I got some here. <laughs> so your body can make mistakes copying that based on what you put in. But you know what? You notice on your computer when you're typing up, there's a spell checker. I can fix that. 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 Then there's a the spell checker. We got a problem, right? You're going to have to help it out. A form of the word, you know, I mean, it can put in commas. It can take out letters. It can do a lot of stuff, that spell checker. But there's times it needs your help. You need to tell it. Is there, that is what's going on in your DNA. There is a spell checker that's going to go through that stuff and find the mistakes, and there are 50 genes I want to show you that are going to fix it. And this, what an incredible creator we have. And so I told him, I said, you know, we sequenced the human genome. It took them 13 years, 2,000 labs, 
5,000 supercomputers took them 13 years to sequence the human genome. Oh, by the way, I pull, I pull out of my pocket a little pencil when he was sitting there, and I, you know, I love visual aids, okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, I showed him the pen, and I said, you know, you could fit on that when you were conceived. But it took them 13 years with 5,000 supercomputers, thousands of scientists, almost $3 billion to sequence the human genome, but that little cell can copy it in 30 hours. And you would have a stack of pages taller than the Empire State Building. And you're, if you were to type out your DNA, be 424 foot tall of pages of information. And think about this. That little spell checker has got to go through all of that and find a mistake. And now we've got 30 hours maximum, 24 to 30 hours. We've got 30 hours, so let's give the spell 10, the, uh, the cell 10, 10 hours to copy 6 billion letter codes. There's 3 billion base pairs, but 6 billion letter codes. Give it 10 hours to copy it. Give the spell checker 10 hours to go through that stack of pages and find a mistake. And then give the army 10 hours, the genes, the 50 genes, 10 hours to fix it. Do you see a guy? This guy was starting, I mean, he was so blown away. He, you know, he teaches this stuff, but he never thought about that process that has to happen. And so uh, here is the, uh, I set up an army, okay? Here's, here's the, the actual genes. Here's a chart of genes that are there to fix it. And the top are damaging agents, the things that damage your DNA, the top two rows. You have x-rays, ultraviolet, you know, you have double strand, you have breaks in your DNA. You have a single strand break, a double strand break, and the DNA can actually fix those breaks. It's got the ability to fix those breaks. It, it tries to match up the codes. It looks around and attaches. It's an amazing story I could go into, but um, the red ones are there to look for cancer. The red genes are there looking for cancer. If we just think about what happens, what a God to come up with that DNA and that cell has to copy that 10 hours and has to make a copy. The spell check will give it 10 hours. The army has to get 10 hours to fix it. When the army gets done, only one in a billion get through. One in a billion get through. Well, there's three billion base pairs, so you get all the maximum mistakes you can have is three mistakes when the army gets done with it. Now, if the army, if you live a good life and you don't have so many mistakes, I suppose the army does an even better job than that. But what a God. So what has to happen? Okay. First, the cell must make a copy, three billion letter or base pairs. Okay. Then the spell checker must find the mistakes. Then the army, the repair team, must repair the mistakes. So then we demolished his evolution. Totally demolished evolution. And I told him, I said, you know, we've got this little amoeba. You know, you say evolution, you know, in some warm little pond, there was some little single cell thing in a warm little pond. That's how everything, life got started. And uh, so we've got maybe a, an amoeba, okay? And this amoeba just bored to death. He sits in this pond, he can't swim, he can't see. He's just bored to death, just floating around, but he's smart. It happens to be the Einstein amoeba. He goes to his computer and he Googles eyeballs and he discovers that if, if you got this mutation, RPE uh, 65, you're born legally blind. I know uh, a friend of mine, Eddie Perez, has that mutation. He's born legally blind. So the amoeba go, whoa, I can evolve eyeballs. All I have to do is, oh, so I'm going to need 6,200,000 good mistakes in copying. You with me on that? He needs beneficial mistakes, 6,200,000. I told you you've got a spell checker that can only be three, one per billion. It's going to take him a long time, gazillions of years to evolve eyeballs. But what's going to happen? With what I've told you now, the cell has to copy it, the spell checker has to go through and find the mistakes, the army fix it. What's going to happen when this amoeba tries to introduce mutations that will give him eyeballs? What's going to happen? Spell checker goes, you're an amoeba. I got an army. You cannot evolve because I got an army that's going to fix what you're trying to do. You see how evolution can't happen. Now, did God just do that so evolution can't happen? No. 
you would never make it out of, where'd my pen go? You'd never make it out of the womb if it wasn't for that process. So evolution can't help. DNA is evolution's death now. Um, we're going downhill, by the way. At every child born, we have 150 mutations. Every child born today has 150 mutations not found in either parent at birth. We are coming down from Adam. And the older we get, the poorer job it does of copying our DNA. And uh, I don't know if we'll get into Dr. John Sanford. Dr. John Sanford, an authority, he has 13 patents in the field of genes, written two books, which I have, Genetic Entropy. Dr. John Sanford uh, wasn't a Christian, but he, he, got a, he sold a gene gun for a billion dollars, and so he stopped teaching over there at Cornell or whatever it was. But he started putting the gene pool back together. If we're going down 150 mutations each generation, he started putting it back together, and he said, when you get back to 200 generations, you didn't come from a monkey. He looked at the gene pool. I don't know how he did that, but he looked at the gene pool, and he goes like, you don't need millions of years. This gene pool, I guess, must have looked pretty good to him. And uh, so, um, anyhow, I shared some stuff with this guy. I don't think he'll ever be the same. Uh, when you demolish evolution right there, you see what their whole process is. They don't know how life started, but it's mutations, copying mistakes that are beneficial and with survival of the fittest, and then here we are today, evolved, you know, from... Uh, okay, uh, um, I think we're probably winding down here, but this is the Hubble Space Telescope took this picture, and it's in the north, and it, uh, it was taken... This picture was taken through a tiny little speck in the sky, like a straw, like looking through a straw. Or they say like a grain of sand at arm's length. Do you think telescopes get big pictures? No. We get the tiniest little speck of the sky and we magnify that little. So this picture was taken 84 hours through a little, like a straw, tiny little speck in the sky. If you're going to photograph the whole sky, you'd need 27 million pictures. But through here, they tell us on the screen are 20,000 galaxies that Hubble saw through a straw. 20,000 on the screen. 20,000. So what are you going to do, Galena, when you get to heaven? God could say, I, you, got an, you got an assignment. I'm going to assign you all the galaxies you can see through this straw. I want you to go check it out. I want you to come back and report every week to me. You're going to get a lot of frequent flyer miles because the Bible says from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. So you're going to have to go out here. If you go out, so let's just look at one of these 20,000 galaxies. Let's just look at one, okay? One galaxy. And, uh, okay, well, here's one galaxy on the screen. So if you're going to cover the stars on one galaxy and you, you spend a, a week, six days on each star system, and you come back before the Lord. It's going to take you 14 billion years, 14 billion, 737 million years to cover all the stars in one galaxy. And now you've got 19,999 more galaxies to go. Well, Isaac Isimov said, I do not believe in the afterlife. This famous sci-fi writer who's dead now. Isaac Isimov said, I do not believe in the afterlife. Therefore, I do not worry about the tortures of hell or even worse, the boredom of heaven. I don't think you're going to get bored because you've got, when you get done with this one after 14 billion years, you've got 19,999 more to go. You know, the Bible tells us that we're going to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, and so should we ever be with the Lord. Yes, this, this universe is incredible. We're going to show you some amazing pictures tomorrow. Uh, I know that Friday night there's usually, the Sabbath is the biggest crowd, so I save the best stuff for church, okay? You think this is nice. Wait till you see tomorrow what we got, okay? And as interesting in early writings, Ellen White was shown, she says, if you're faithful, you and the 4,400,000 shall have the privilege of visiting all the worlds and viewing the handiwork of God. And uh, like I said, if you're just going to visit one star, one a week, one week on each star system would take you approximately 14 billion, 737 million years. And you've only just begun. Oh, there's more to this program. The peacock 
You know, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him, all the earth, the peacock feather. You know, if that amoeba is going to evolve peacock feathers, you know what he has to do? He has to learn differential and integral calculus. The mathematics to develop the peacock's feather, here it is. You have a lipsoid and a corduroid, and well, several lipsoids. But here is the math that it would take to make a peacock feather. That is the math. And I'm no mathematician. I thought astronomers have to be mathematicians. No, you can hire mathematicians. I hired a college kid that had to drop out of college. He was a genius, but he got in some financial trouble with a young lady and couldn't finish, so he worked for me for the rest of my business. But look at this. If a corduroid is generated, I mean, this is Greek to me, okay? A corduroid is generated by rolling a circle on a circle with the same radius. You know what that means? A corduroid is a plane curved traced by a point on a per parameter of a circle, per whatever that is of a circle, I can't even read, uh, that is rolling around a fixed circle of the same radius. It is used frequently in higher math mathematics to make a peacock feather. How does that peacock evolve? Something like that. I have t a serious case of dyslexia, folks. What is that word? The parameter? Perimeter. Per perimeter. Okay, perimeter. Sorry about that. Okay, the guy's a mathematician, okay? And the ellipsoid is, a symmetric, is symmetrically about three mutually perpendicular axes. Is that complex? <laughs> it's sym symmetry, symmetrical, symmetrical. About three mutually perpendicular axes that intersects at the center and is a closed quadratic surface that is a three-dimensional analog of an ellipse. That is total Greek to me, <laughs> but not to God. He's a mathematician, okay? And this little bug is just amazing. He is like a millimeter, well, he's uh, 400 thousandths long. He could sit on the areas on the head of the pin, this little bug. I can't even pronounce the name, of course, but he would fit on the head of the pin, and he has got gears in his hips. And the, because of the mechanics of this, he can jump like you can't believe. Here is his gears and his hips under an electron microscope. That is smaller than the human hair, the gears on his hips that he jumps with. And, uh, okay, there... Seventy thousandths, oh, that would be, no, that would be, uh, yeah, that would be, yeah, of an inch, the gears are. Uh, my hair is about two thousandths of an inch. Okay, I got thin hair. Uh, people have fatter hair. His legs spring with one, three hundred thousandths of a second of each other. They have, when he jumps, these things have got to be within three hundred thousandths of a second, or he'll go off to the side and his enemy will eat him. Okay, here's the name, a small hopping insect, that's his name up there, used tooth gears, magnified an electron microscope to precisely synchronize the kicks of his hind legs as he jumps forward, all images cor uh, courtesy there of that Burroughs guy. In the late 1940s, the famous evolutionist, J.B.S. Harding, predicted we would not find wheels, no wheels in living creatures. Well. This little guy, you can see the mechanics of this because you can see the gear is down here and you can see the leverage he has. I mean, this is a mechanical, that's a lever that, that gives him this ability to jump. And then faster than you can blink or think or see with the naked eye, the entire thing is gone. In two milliseconds, it has bulleted skyward, accelerating at 400 Gs. How many Gs can you do on a plane, okay, a, rock, a jet? a rate more than 20 times what the human body can withstand. At top speed, the jumper breaks three miles an hour, quite a feat considering its body is less than one-tenth of an inch. If you could jump like that, you would be going 6,200 miles an hour and you would weigh 60,000 pounds. Is that an amazing creature? The Bible tells us, for the invisible things of him, the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Wonders without number, his ways are past finding out. For the wrath of God is revealed in verse 18, Romans 1, 18, that through the invisible things of the earth, for the invisible things of earth from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that they are without excuse. There's no excuse. An Air Force officer, Jay Strapp, demonstrated a human can withstand 46 Gs. His body weighed 7,700 pounds for a few seconds, a short period of time. They say, and it's gone from my screen, I guess, that this, you would be going faster than a fastest Winchester bullet if you could do what this little bug does. Now, this is kind of interesting. They've been looking for intelligent life out there. Uh, through SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. In fact, in our building, we rented part of our building to somebody, and every night when they went home, they'd turn their computers off, and they'd go on SETI and look through all this data coming to see if there's any intelligent life. And if they had something that goes, dit, 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 da, 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 dit, 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 they say, ah, there's, that's SOS, Morse code for SOS. So they're looking for something intelligent uh, information out there to see if there's life out there. And the director of SETI said, if we could find something like prime numbers or the Fibonacci sequence, we would know there's life in space. And I go, da, did you see the Fibonacci sequence? Who made that? An intelligent mind, right? <laughs> If we could find that in space, we'd say there's intelligent life out there, okay? Well, the Fibonacci sequence is, uh, is the golden ratio, uh, describes everything from the number of uh, veins in a leaf to a magnetic resonance, the spin of a cobalt niobate crystal, a Fibonacci sequence. Uh, the formula, there's a formula for it, but it basically is taking uh, Fibonacci, each number in a series is calculated by adding the two numbers before it. So when you look at that shell, uh, that, all, that is the Fibonacci <coughs> sequence. But we see it all over. We see it all over. Look at the sunflower. Look at the sequence in the sunflower. And look at uh, <laughs> a fern. Again, the Fibonacci sequence. We see it all over. And they're saying, if we could just get data from space, we would know, or if they could, you could take your DNA and put it on a spacecraft at Elsa Centauri and send it back here, they'd say there's intelligent life just looking at the DNA. Well, this is about the end of uh, tonight's program. Um, the prodigal son. You know, um, I have a, I better get my cane, I think. I had a guy that came, a UPS driver came to my door. And this an evening, and, and I had the garage door open, I had a big old telescope in there, huge telescope in there. And he says, oh, I, I got the wrong house. I was going to your neighbor. Oh, what do you got? Can I take a picture of that? Can I take a video of that? So he came in the garage and took a picture. And uh, he said, are you a Christian? And I said, yes. He said, God brought me the wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, we didn't plug it in, did we? Um, I brought the transformer, but I didn't plug it in. Well, no, I better, I better plug it in. It's in, in the case up here, because there's one more slide I want to share with you. Um, I forgot to plug that thing in. So this guy, oh, it's in front, in the front, this, right there, yeah. This guy said, are you a Christian? And then, he figured I was an old guy and I'd probably had all the answers. So the next day he started calling me. He got my phone number. And uh, is that going to reach? It's going to be close. Okay, I could maybe turn this. I don't know. If it, yeah, right, right here. <laughs> I will learn for tomorrow. Okay, there we go. So he got my phone number and... Uh, the next day, he started calling me, 
And he had all kinds of Bible questions. How do you love your neighbor as yourself? He's actually he was quite knowledgeable on a lot of stuff in the Bible. How do you love your neighbor as yourself? And, and uh, you know, what about the rapture? What about speaking? He'll tell you all kinds of questions. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning, he says, what about the Sabbath? And I said, I told him about the Sabbath. Would you send me everything you have on the Sabbath? And he, at 106, this battery went dead. He wrote, wore out my battery with Bible questions. Well, the next day, I was charged up, and we're back on the phone again. He, he's like every day calling with Bible questions. <laughs> and I figure he's, I, he figures I'm old, I probably got all the answers. Anyhow, the next day, he's, he's on the phone. He says, just excuse me, i got to deliver And he put it in his pocket, and I could hear him talk to the customer. And he said to the customer, you know what I just found out? I just found out Saturday is the Sabbath. <laughs> One day. <laughs> And I said to him, how often do you, how many times do you tell people? He said, almost everybody, and nobody argues with me. So, um, but then one day he said, boy, when I get to heaven, I am going to really get it from God. The way I've lived, I'm going to really get it. And I said, no, Matthew, I said, that's purgatory. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. I said, when you get to heaven, God's going to have a party. Look at what it says in Zephaniah 3.17. God's going to sing over you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing, Matthew, as in a party, a day of festival. <laughs> Where did you find that? Send that to me. <laughs> um, and it's been exciting. You know, we still hear from him now and then. He moved to California, but uh, anyway, um, you know, that father was looking down that road. I don't care what he was doing. He was keeping an eye on that road. Is my boy coming home? Is my boy coming home? The reason we know that the Bible says he saw him, he met him a great way off. So that father is watching. That's God uh, watching down that road. Is my boy coming home? And there's a statement in Christ's Obic Lessons that I like. She said, Arise, go to your father. He will meet you a great way off. If you take one step toward the Savior in repentance, he will enfold you in his arms of love. Never a prayer is offered, however secret, however uh, fault. Uh, never, uh, Faltering. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. You have any faltering prayers, you have to apologize. Lord, I called you up and put you on hold. My mind wandered. Lord, I went to sleep. Lord, apologize for your prayer. We do, don't we? Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it. And I left out one word. She says, if you take even one step, that's a very important word. If you take even one step toward the Savior, he will enfold you in his arms of infinite. Let's read it uh, from Christ's Abic Lessons. Arise, go to your Father. He will meet you a great way off. If you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. Uh, his ear is open to the cry of a contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after God is cherished, however feeble. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it, even before the prayer is uttered. Or the yearning of the heart made known, grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. Your Heavenly Father will take from you the garment defiled by sin. Anybody have questions, that, anything we've covered that you'd like to ask? And, yes? I have one question, the same thing, but two parts to it. So when you showed that picture of the sun and it was spouting off, so what particles was it spouting off? And when it does that, does the sun get smaller because it's losing? <coughs> yeah, the sun uh, does lose because it gives off, uh, I forget the millions of, Tons of mass, it's burning of hydrogen. Uh, the sun gets smaller every year by 80 feet. The diameter is getting 80 feet smaller every year. Um, 
the, uh, we see we have sunspots on the sun that are magnetic storms, and we're getting into an increase. I mean, I've seen like 50 black, it looked like blackheads on my telescope. It, it, it's mag cold magnetic storms on the sun. They're there 14, it takes 14 days. I'll see them here today, next day, next day, 14 days, 28 days for it to rotate. And around these magnetic uh, storms, uh, that's where we get the eruptions. We get the coronal mass ejections and flares shooting off. And uh, a typical flare is probably gone in 20 minutes. Uh, I remember I called my wife, come and take a look, you know, and, uh, uh, and I see, that I, I think it's increasing. And she, and she looks, and then when I look back, it's like doubled. It goes up about, these flares go about 400 miles a second. And, but it's 93 million miles away, so uh, all kinds of solar activity. And when they're headed, if they're headed right at us, it's, it can be very dangerous. We could lose satellites, uh, charged particles from the sun. In uh, 1986, I believe it was, there were feeder lines in Quebec, 200 miles of feeder line that were wiped out, melted. Because every metal, because of the, uh, uh, the charged particles from the sun, a voltage will be induced in any any metal. And, uh, and so when a charged particle is headed right at, at us, it can be dangerous to take out satellites and all kinds of stuff. In the 1800s, it was uh, uh, telegraph lines that were melted with another one of those. Now, we haven't had one directly. I can show you some pictures. Maybe we'll do it tomorrow. I'll show you some pictures of some of these eruptions going off 10 million miles. I mean, um, and we haven't, and towards Mars or whatever, but actually coming straight at us is when it's dangerous, you know. Okay. Um, you could look at uh, Psalm 102, 25, 26. Old he laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of his hands. They will perish, but God will, uh, how does it go? Uh, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them. Okay, this is a vesture casting off an outer shell. Hebrews 1, uh, 11 has the same thing. Uh, the Bible tells us the earth is getting old like a garment. And so in the stars, uh, there's uh, in, uh, another one in Isaiah, I forget how it goes. Um, and so uh, the whole creation, you see, through the, the law of entropy, is wearing down. Second law of thermodynamics, it's all wearing down. The earth is getting old. When I, we see the earthquakes in Turkey. I said, is that because the earth is getting old? You see, it tells us time and time again, the foundation uh, the earth is getting old. And it's wearing out like a garment. And, uh, and then the plates shift under yeah. the earth. And yeah. yeah. It's getting old. So, uh, And there's a good verse, there's a good scripture that talks about the very thing on the sun, and it escapes me now. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, um, for instance, Betelgeuse I mentioned here with the rings. Uh, we see it as it was 650 some years ago. Right. It takes 600 years for light to get here. Uh, but if you look at the uh, Daniel, I think at two different times was praying and the angel was sent, and it took the angel four minutes to get here. Right. You see. Pardon? Yeah. Well, you see, and I have a program uh, on the fourth dimension. Uh, if you look at Ephesians 3.17, it says that. Uh, it talks about the length, the breadth, the height, the depth. That's four dimensions. Uh, and the love of Christ is the fourth dimension it mentions there. But this is long and wide and high. Three. What's the fourth dimension? Well, there's a dimension, if you look in the Bible, that time and time again, their eyes were opened. You know, uh, Balaam was on the donkey. There was an angel in front of him, but he couldn't see the donkey, but 
his eyes were open to another dimension, and he saw the donkey. Adam and Eve's eyes were opened. We could look at, uh, you know, Christ came right through a wall, met with the disciples. Same uh, thing with his life pardon? Same thing with his life there. Yeah. So uh, there's another dimension which, which the angels are in, not restricted to time like we are. Um, and uh, it's one of the programs I do with the Pac-Man, Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man on the screen. There are two, two dimensions. You know, they just go this way and this way. I can be closer to Mrs. Pac-Man than Mr. he can. But if I try to tell them, I want, to, want them to know what it's like in a third dimensional world. I'm going to poke my finger through the screen. And they go around, oh, the third dimension is a circle, right? You see, they can't understand another dimension. But yeah, God's not limited to that. I mean, we see it right there when Jesus walks through the walls. You know, and he ate a fish and he walked back out. What happened to the fish when he went back through the wall? I don't know. <laughs> I believe that. Yes, we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, you and I, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You and I cannot get in a spacecraft and go at this, well, millions of times faster than the speed of light. You know, carbon matter can't move at the speed of light. You'd be, if you could travel at the speed of light, you would be infinitely heavy. And you'd need a really big rocket, you know, or go on a diet like a feather. You'd get better chances of of going to the speed of light if you were no bigger than a feather. But, uh, yeah, we're limited, you see. Um, but God is not. God is not. And uh, you know, one other thing, you know, Adam, when Adam and Eve failed at the garden, the, they parted them uh, was taken away. Uh, you know, the, the ability to, to, uh, to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot about that we don't know, you know, but uh, well, we have the evidence that God is there and he's coming soon, you know. Any other questions? Well, bring your friends tomorrow. We got some really good stuff tomorrow to show you. All right. Well, thank you so much. My brain is hurting. <laughs> you fried your brain? But, yes. <laughs> But in a good way, in a good way. Are you thankful you came tonight? I mean, it's amazing. It, it just gives us a little glimpse, like you said, kind of like just the, the tip of the iceberg. We're just beginning. Uh, yeah, as the heavens are higher than the earth, there's just no way to really fully understand all this. But we can at least attempt, and I appreciate all his uh, information that he's gathered over the years. And that's, it's a real blessing to have him here. Um, so yes, invite people tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, we'll have three programs, one for the 11 o'clock hour or you know, 11.30 or approximately. Then we'll have one after lunch because we'll have lunch here. At, it'll be around 3 o'clock. Then we could take another little break after that one and then we'll have another one later on around 6 o'clock. It won't be like super strict, but you know, depending on how everybody feels and how everybody moves around, uh, right, right in that ballpark. Dinosaur is tomorrow night. I'm sorry? Dinosaurs tomorrow oh, night. Oh, yes. Yeah, you're going to be talking about more about dinosaurs tomorrow night. The, that's for the last one, yeah? Around that's 6 o'clock. the last one, yeah. Okay. So the 3 o'clock one, how long is that going to last? So oh. the 3, what, an hour, hour and a half? At least an hour, yeah. Oh. Yeah, maybe a little over an hour. Kind of like tonight. It's about, about an hour and 15, 20 minutes or so. So, whew, yeah, bring your notepads and start jotting down. <laughs> I tried to keep up, but I, I just gave up. <laughs> But anyway, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's just amazing. It's mind-boggling, and I'm, I can't wait to be uh, one of those 144,000 that follows the Lord throughout the universe as He gives us a guided tour of all the beauty that He's created. It's just going to be uh, uh, it's just words words cannot say, words cannot explain it. Well, let's stand together and we'll close out with prayer. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, and I really appreciate it. Father in heaven, we are humbled and we are highly privileged uh, that Jesus, the Son of, the, of God, the, the King of the universe, left whatever beauties there are in the universe to come down to this little speck of sand uh, to, to become one of us.
to live like us with all the difficulties. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. Here he has created all these uh, Betelgeuse and Arcturus and all these stars and all these galaxies, billions upon billions, but yet he came here to this earth to spend his whole, a whole lifetime serving humanity. And then after all that, he gets hung on a cross for all his troubles. And he did this willingly knowing that he could save his children. He could save his creation through his blood. And we're ever grateful for this. We, I don't think we even begin to understand truly what has been sacrificed in our behalf. And we pray, Lord, that we get to heaven, that we make it there through Blood, the, through the blood of Christ, through his merits, so that then we can spend throughout eternity studying this great redemption that has taken place in our behalf, this great sacrifice. And I just pray that we all will be there. I pray that uh, our daughters, our sons, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our uncles and aunts, those who maybe have drifted away, would come back before it's too late. Lord, we keep praying. And help us who are in the church to continue learning and humbly entreating them, um, not only with our words, but also, of course, with our actions and our life. Let Jesus shine through us and forgive us when we haven't allowed that to happen. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, thank you, everyone. God bless.